and take the reins. Yes. Uh, so hi everybody. I'm Bahar Jassim. I came for originally from Iraq. I'm based in Italy. I'm um, a Tech for Peace initiative that come back taking news in uh, in Iraq, especially and Middle East uh, spokesman and also one of the co-founders of the initiative itself. Okay, so that's our, our panel. I'm gonna I thank you all very much. And now what I want to do is with uh, pleasure introduce uh, uh, Faisal. Hello everyone. Uh, this is Faisal Saeed Al Mutar. I'm the founder and president of Ideas Beyond Borders. And just like Bahar uh, or Bahar, I'm, I'm Bahar, right? I'm also originally from Iraq. So maybe I start with a quick introduction and then I will frame uh, the issue for the, the at least from my perspective. And I'm also, I share both everyone's, every panels here about uh, really the, more, the most exciting thing about this event is us learning from each other and coming from big, different backgrounds and working in different parts of the region and uh, as well as the people who are gonna be in the Q&A. So uh, a quick introduction about myself. I am Faisal, I'm originally from Iraq and I live currently in the United States. And Iraq have its own story of misinformation and disinformation. So I grew up the first uh, third of my life under the regime of Saddam Hussein in which most of the media was controlled by three channels and that's where most of the information used to come from. And then we moved from what I call, we moved from 1984 to Brave New World uh, in a year. And that's when the US war in 2003 happened in which we moved from two channels to a thousand and in which every political party and every faction of society has one. So um, what, what's, what actually became interesting is that, yeah, we moved from controlled truth or controlled propaganda into to some extent, uh, a post-truth world in which it's really difficult uh, to know more, to actually know what is true. And, and that's why I get to know a lot of the organizations that is now uh, working locally uh, to fight misinformation, which is an initiative that we very happily highlight. So I founded the organization, which is called Ideas Beyond Borders um, as of three years ago. And one of the issues, I mean, there are a lot of issues in the Middle East and we cannot solve all of them. However, one of the issues that I found within our control and our ability is to solve the, the issue of content scarcity. So for those of you who probably don't know is Arabic is one of the least represented languages on the internet. And there, when we started the organization, all is 0.6% of online content in Arabic. Now it's about 1%. And not only there is very little content in Arabic, there is very little factual content in Arabic. So the goal was as, a, as an organization, as a small nonprofit, is to really change that. And I have assembled a team of roughly 120 people who live in different parts of the MENA region, including Iraq, of course, and working with partners on the ground to try to change that. And it's been uh, kind of an interesting journey because there are, I mean, the Middle East, as you know, is a very wide region and there are different dynamics, which I'm sure we're gonna to touch into in this, in this panel. But really the issue of misinformation um, or disinformation, whether a state or non-state run, is not new to the region. It's not new to the world, but it's not new to the region at all. And what I think is really interesting is that we're gonna have like a common theme between um, the region as a whole is that censorship is a major one. And also the fact that, that we have a lot of state actors who are influencing the media landscape in the region, whether it's gonna be regional actors uh, from Gulf states or from Iran or, or, or others, or it's gonna be out of region states, uh, which is mainly powered by, started first by Russia today, and then adding the, the influence, the recent influence of China on the media landscape in the region. And that's something that when we, when COVID-19 started, or at least the concept of, of 19 was bubbling up, is, is around about January and February, I've started seeing um, a lot of also research has backed back this up in terms of how many state actors were really organizing uh, great campaigns 
around the subject of how can they frame it to make it about a Western conspiracy and how is it really um, all just made up by by the West uh, textually to harm the, the populations locally. So the first example that I have seen, which is unfortunately was shared by my cousin, <laughs> uh, and, and which is, I mean, we all have our cousins that we're not very proud of all the time, but um, so, and I've seen him sharing the video from CGTN, which is the Chinese official television that is operates in the region uh, in Arabic. And what was really interesting is that the journalist who is from China spoke fluent Arabic. And she was, and there was this video that went viral that received more than a million of you, I think one point, now by now 1.5 million of you of how the US did bring up the virus into China and it was US created virus. And then weeks after is that the bubbling up started with other um, non-state actors and state actors who really were confirming that message and spreading it across the region. So there is often a lot to talk about, but I just want to frame that really the region has had this history of misinformation, disinformation for a while. There are new actors that are coming to the game, uh, mainly one of them is TGTN. And there are also great initiatives that are popping up um, in the region that are trying to counter that. And I'm so honored to be joining, joining with some of them. So do you, David? Okay, um, very good. Um, so, so panelists, um, you know, given this uh, uh, brief introduction to the landscape, um, what kind of work uh, are you doing to combat disinformation and hate speech and conspiracy theories in, in social media? Um, Carolyn, do you want to kick things off? Yeah, actually, I might actually um, even suggest that my colleague Christina says a little bit about this, because we work in two different ways. One is producing content, but one is also working on how content is received, so how the audience um, has better digital literacy to understand and process and recognize um, things like hate speech and fake news. So um, Christina is, um, is our expert on this in the media department. So if I may, perhaps I might hand over and she can just say a bit about this two-pronged approach that Adrienne has. Thank you, Caroline. Expert is a big word, actually, but it's good that we're involved in something to benefit the society. Um, uh, I would thank also Faisal for this um, informative introduction about misinformation and disinformation. It's like what we called recently the infodemic as well. And we know that the information disorders actually have different aspects, uh, not only uh, related to news, related to health, but also we are also concerned about uh, information related to uh, religious diversity and cultural diversity. Uh, before uh, telling you about the work that we're doing, I would like to share with you a small story that I faced years ago when I was back in university. Uh, we had to do a paper, a uh, research analysis about uh, the narrative of ISIS. So I had to go to YouTube and search all the ISIS videos, you know, these violent uh, narratives and the violent uh, images that you can see on YouTube. So I did this research for one week almost. And then I found out two weeks after that research that my YouTube is all about, I can see that videos you might like, is all about uh, similar videos and similar content that I found on YouTube and then I found uh, on Twitter and then I found on Google. So I found myself facing the same content uh, all the time just because I searched for a while about a specific topic. And it happens that this topic is based on an extremist uh, content. I'm telling you this story to say that the new media is forming bubbles, what is called the social media bubbles because when we talk about the algorithm of machine learning, we understand that all the content that we're receiving is not actually objective, but we're receiving content that we are based on our behavior, on our digital identity, et cetera. But these bubbles are not only virtual and they're not only uh, online, but they are offline as well. So we see that um, violent extremism in the real life is also um, it comes from these bubbles where people just live in uh, their, their areas with their communities, with the people that they think the same. 
So this is why we decided in Adyan Foundation and specifically in the media to break these bubbles. And I'm gonna talk about our work based on two aspects. First, we developed um, a media platform uh, called Ta'adidiya, which means pluralism in English. So this platform aims at uh, promoting freedom of religion and belief, preventing violent extremism, uh, promote the acceptance of differences in the Arab world. And uh, Faisal, you said that in the Arab world, we don't have Arabic content online and we don't have a factual content. Actually, we are proud that um, this platform is 100% Arabic and uh, we do provide factual information about different cultures and religions in, in the Arab world. So Ta'adidiya has different uh, sections. First, we have uh, a section called opinion articles, which is based on um, the opinion of um, academic sc scholars and academics interested in uh, religious uh, matters. Uh, so also the, all these uh, scholars are from the Arab world, from different uh, countries. In addition, we do have different uh, uh, media shows or campaigns. And here I'm going to mention something uh, that a narrative that Ta'adudiya adopts, it's the existential narrative. Because when we want to counter uh, the narrative of the extremists, we have to find uh, a narrative that is as powerful to be able to counter the narrative of the, of the extremists or even the misinformation. When we want to face and counter misinformation, we have to create a powerful information that convince people the same way. So what we decided is to use something and to develop a concept called existential narrative, because I don't think there is something as much as powerful as the real stories of people. So the existential narrative is based on stories of people who are doing change in their communities. And here we developed um, uh, a show called Shu'ustak, What is Your Story? We go and film stories of people uh, around the Arab world that are doing, um, promoting peace building, promoting freedom of religion and belief, uh, working on social cohesion in their communities and countering violent extremism. So we have stories from Lebanon, from Iraq, from Egypt, from Tunisia, from Oman and Syria. So um, a lot of these people are um, becoming the heroes because we know in the Arab world, the image of the hero is based on violence. The more you are violent, the more you, you are the hero. This is the strength. But we wanted to show based on this existential narrative that heroes can be peaceful as well. They are doing change in their communities. So this is a new profile. In addition to that, we also um, developed our concept on how we can uh, make our work more uh, complete or this cycle of change. So we thought that in the media, there is coding and decoding of the message. So for example, when we code the message as Ta'adudiya, we code a message that is inclusive, that is positive, but if the people and the public that we are targeting are not able and are not literate enough to receive and decode the message the right way, the right way, so then like our narrative will not be as powerful as it should be. And this also applies on what Faisal was saying, the misinformation, because decoding is the message. If people do not know how to decode a media message and do not know how the media works in general, they will not be able to distinguish between information or misinformation or know if this fake or not. So this is why we developed a project based on the concept of media literacy to equip students in the school, uh, in schools to understand how media works. And the project that we are currently working on in Lebanese schools is um, uh, targeting students uh, aged between 13 and 14 to learn about how they can understand hate speech in specific on social media and how can they counter this hate speech by very small acts like a command by not sharing by reporting a content by reporting specific content distinguishing between misinformation and other information disorders that they face and we all know when people are not I'll go to the main idea and finish here if people are not media literate they will be, have this tendency 
to get stuck in the social media bubbles and even in uh, the bubbles of the real life as well and not be able to meet the other and to learn about the other. Uh, so breaking these bubbles will help us to uh, achieve and build the social cohesion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Christina. Um, <clears throat> Carolyn, would you want to add a bit to that and then we'll move on to Bahar? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things. One is that, you know, what Christina was talking about, about breaking bubbles. Of course, everything that we're doing online, and of course, in 2020, the online space, you know, has really been a space where everyone's been spending a lot of time. But uh, we're also, of course, always thinking about the offline work that we do as well. So while we're thinking about um, people's online behavior, the kind of content they might um, interact with. We also have many projects that are again focused on breaking these bubbles and one of which is our work in schools. So we make sure that we always have that approach as well. So we're thinking, I know today's conversation is about um, the online space, but we definitely take a very comprehensive approach to that as well, thinking about in person as well as um, as well as the online space. And you know something that um, you know my second point was, Something that we're very keen to understand is how people change their behavior based on what they interact with online and this is a lot of um, a big focus i think for not just us but a lot of organizations because um, it's very easy of course to say what people are looking at you know anyone can say how many views or how much reach content has had but how has that actually impacted on their behavior and i think one of the concerns is you know the bubbles that we've been talking about a concern is that perhaps you see something online, maybe you agree with it, maybe it resonates with you, but then you go back to your real life bubble and you contain, can you continue acting, acting in the same way. So we're keen to also study what kind of change is made in the offline space. And that's some work that we're doing. Um, and as part of that, my final thing I wanted to say, as part of that, we, um, Adian partnered with Facebook to assess how our CVE, our counter violent extremism content, how that is received by users who had been assessed as being vulnerable to having violent extremist sympathy. So that's a partnership that we did as part of this process of trying to understand uh, what is the real life engagement and real life impact of the online work that we do. Very good, thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, Bahar? So yes, um, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning that I came from Iraq originally, how the idea that came uh, in order to present such an initiative called the Tech for Peace uh, nowadays or now like in front of you. Uh, 2014, uh, we all know that when uh, when ISIS came and took mm -hmm. over a major part of uh, of Iraq, uh, started with the uh, second biggest city in Iraq, it's called Mosul. Uh, how the city has been fallen at that time? It fall by 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 the disinformation, by the false uh, information that they were uh, spreading, the propaganda that we we're playing. So uh, if we wanted to measure like how big is it that this topic that we are talking about that uh, a city is uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people like um, uh, get, got uh, displaced, uh, uh, they have been unfortunately killed or injured or uh, uh, that that all of that came because of the rumors. So me and my colleagues, me and my friends, that uh, at that time, that we were thinking how we can help our community, how we can uh, give such a, a a help to 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 the, the the country that we are living in by by the our tools uh, uh, for sure, like. We can't like all of us just uh, get into the uh, into the army or holding a gun or st being uh, in front of them. There is uh, those who uh, of us that they can use their technology, their social media, and also what they are good at. So in, in 2016 and 2014 we were uh, trying in order to prevent uh, falling more of the cities in Iraq by the, uh, the rumors, by the, the, the propaganda and, uh, and disinformation that were, they were spreading. Uh, I still remember until now, 
uh, how it started by by posting uh, from ISIS side at that time. They were uh, they they posted like uh, photos of uh, small babies. They have been. Uh, being victims because of uh, of uh, 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 of uh, such a, a bomb that happened, and then they were using a caption uh, uh, for that feed uh, photos by saying, uh, "Look what the, the the government has been doing to the the part." Uh, the the part. If I want to talk about the names, like they were calling the Shiite government what they are doing to the Sunni uh, people at the, in the region at that time. And then if you do a small research, because it wasn't like clear enough to the people, if you do a small research, you will find out that photos itself, they went from Iraq. And also uh, posting uh, videos about uh, a mosque that has been fallen, uh, got like a, an explosion and bump, and they were like, uh, uh, posting that uh, this is what the government they do themselves to the to the mosques that belong to the Sunni people. So at that time, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people they have uh, uh, believed actually that uh, uh, they have believed uh, what 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 the rumors they were saying. Uh, so so unfortunately, they have been joined uh, ISIS at that time. Uh, many people, and also getting back to the to the uh, to the armies. Uh, uh, departments when they were uh, uh, showing that numbers of the of the uh, ISIS members they had been uh, getting in the city by hundreds of thousands of uh, 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 unarmed people. Th that's that's the, the the reason that the army left. That's the reason a lot of people had been joined the uh, ISIS at the time. So this explains what. Uh, uh, misinformation, disinformation can do actually, and then we couldn't reheal from what happened at that time into two, three years by giving a lot of efforts by the, the international union, by the Iraq government itself. So from there, we started. Uh, uh, the, the Tech for Peace initiative by showing the people know that uh, the, the, the photos for the babies, they were in Iraq, they were in Syria, that that mosque has been actually exploded in, in 2006 in, in, in other part of Iraq. Uh, so it wasn't like from the current time. Uh, this is how uh, we started to, to work at that time. And then from there, we have been expanding the Tech for Peace idea, the Tech for Peace initiative in order to, to, to combat uh, fake news, uh, all of the aspects of fake news uh, being a misinformation and disinformation and malinformation. And we can get into uh, 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 the definition of all of these terms later on. So uh, until this moment, after four years of, uh, of uh, building uh, and establishing the initiative, that we are, what we see how, how the misinformation, even though uh, uh, Iraq has been liberated all from uh, ISIS since 2017, but we can see also a small uh, stuff that how that can affect uh, the social cohesion and pluralism. Uh, I, I can give an, an recent example. Just uh, yesterday, it happened. Uh, I know that in in some of people's heart, where to to, to separate the the hate speech and 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 and, uh, and rumors, but then also like uh, the the fake news, the 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 misinformation gives them that opportunity actually to express what they feel inside themselves uh, toward to the, or the community themselves. Uh, yesterday, for example, there was a photo of a Kurdish flag from Kurdistan talking about, uh, uh, the, uh, and they have me modified that photo with the Photoshop and showing that uh, in a state of, uh, of the, the uh, the sun inside the flag, it wrote uh, 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 the men of the, of the south. So when we showed the people that this photo has been actually modified and then it's not true. So that fake news gave actually a space 
for those who you know, they can express by commenting against social cohesion by telling, oh, we didn't know, for example, uh, this is just a, so between the codes of the comments that I am saying, oh, we didn't know that there were men exist actually also in Kurdish part. So these small comments by by thousands that can follow and then uh, it's given a space by an uh, 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 misinformation and disinformation itself. So this is uh, how we control and combat fake news by explaining to the people, not just in order to telling them, no, that's a fake news, in order to teach them, in order not to react with thoughts so the, of the misinformation and going on around. Thank you, uh, Bahar, for that real world example uh, just happened yesterday. Uh, really good stuff. Um, I, I think I would be remiss if I didn't give uh, Faisal just a short, a brief opportunity to talk about what uh, uh, what IBB does, because I don't think in his introduction he, he really zeroed in on that. Faisal, could you just give us, uh, a, 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 our guests, a brief uh, uh, explanation of what IBB does to combat disinformation? Yes, of course. And, and, and just, I mean, I'm really interested to see the research, Caroline. I mean, that's... Uh, um, if you're able to crack the code, uh, you, you deserve a Nobel Peace Prize, in my opinion. Uh, so that's that's really great that you guys are working on that. And for ideas beyond borders, so when uh, we have a long-term solution and short-term solution, and the long-term solution is really shared by some panelists, is that we need to prevent misinformation before it takes root, and that is by creating video, engaging video content, and as well as articles and infographics that teach people about critical thinking and media literacy. Because the question is that not only um, how to, is, is not only what to think, but also how to navigate the information landscape that we have right now. You go on Facebook and you, you go to the newsfeed and you are bombarded by a hundred articles as you cross and how to differentiate fact from fiction is really has been the, the drive of, of the content creation that we have, which is original content that we create. We have partnered with our uh, allies at Wikipedia Arabic um, to make sure that all of the articles related to critical thinking, media literacy, um, as well as even the now recent stuff with the US elections and, and formerly on the COVID-19 vaccines and others to be constantly updated and well-referenced. So we have a team that constantly works with Wikipedia Arabic um, and Wikipedia Kurdish to some extent to make sure that all of these articles are constantly updated and, and, and constantly reflecting of what the people are, are searching for um, all the time. And then we have created a lot of infographics um, back to kind of creating engaging content, how to create content that can go as uh, viral as the misinformation that is also going viral. And our content, so all of that campaign, whether it's, gonna, whether it's the articles and the videos and the infographics, I think by now have received about 50 million views uh, on social media. And so, some, so one of the things we, we also try to emphasize on and within our, our uh, social media team is also try to, when we create advertising on Facebook and advertising on the online content is to target the places in which one misinformation is spreading. So when we're creating uh, videos that counter the misinformation the conspiracies about ISIS, or, or sorry, about COVID, um, we, we try to target people who watch Russia Today and people who watch uh, places in which where most of this misinformation is also being spread. So one of the things that I've been very cautious on um, and from the beginning of the organization is we don't want to create a bubble and we don't want to create an audience that actually uh, are the kind of the pre receptive audience to us, but rather reach out to different audiences who might be more uh, receptive or, or to, to different ideas, but also to, to misinformation. And really the, the ultimate goal for us is, is to be the leading source of factual information, um, as well as information about, about freedom and, and, and enlightenment ideals um, in Arabic and multiple languages spoken in the region. Thank you, Faisal. So, um... 
We're going to move on to a different question, and uh, Carol and or Christina, either one of you could take this. Um, how does uh, Adyen Foundation use uh, uh, its digital platform to promote social cohesion and pluralism? Okay. Christina, I think you already talked a little bit about this to do with um, with yes. Sue Ostak and the existential narrative, but I wonder if you wanted to also talk a little bit more about Fina Nekidin or some of our other online content. Yes, of course. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, we have this uh, website called Tadzia, and we extended the online presence of Tadzia by using also related social media accounts. So we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, we are on Instagram and definitely on YouTube. But the main platform that we are currently using is Facebook because we found out that um, the target, our target audience, which are Arab countries youth between 25 and 34 are more active on Facebook currently as to get information to watch videos mainly. So this is why our campaigns uh, are based on our videos based. Uh, the show stack video is based on, um, uh, we do film videos, maximum of two minutes, 20. So we try to make it as well um, suitable for different platforms like two, 20, two minutes, 20 seconds. Also it fits uh, Twitter as well. So we try to make it uh, across platforms. Um, in addition, we have the other campaign called um, uh, We Can Talk About Religion. It's about breaking uh, the stereotypes about religions and about differences between, uh, between religions. But I can say that we use social media based on the target audience. For example, we use Facebook for the youth. We use Twitter for uh, more um, uh, religious uh, problematics uh, for discussions. We use Instagram for more content related to pictures and to polls and to questions. So we are trying to customize our uh, content to fit with each uh, platform. I hope that answered your question. We're talking about the format more than the content, right? Yeah, that, that's, that makes sense. Uh, we do want to uh, um, talk in terms of the you know what are the what are the tools we're at, at this moment? We'll get, we'll dig into a little bit more about uh, successful examples and things like that in just in just a minute. Awesome. Thank you for that, uh, Carolyn. Did you want to add to that or? Are we... Yeah, I just wanted to add, and it was also addressing one of the questions that we've received in the chat about this link between the online content that Christina has been talking about and then our offline, our in-person work as well. And you know, and it's something that we are very conscious of. At Adia, you know, we have our own media department, so we're very keen to not just um, promote our projects, but you know, media is a project for us. But we always maintain that link with our other work as well. So there's many links between the online content that we're doing and our um, offline or real-world networks that we have. So some of the content that Christina is talking about, either people who are core participants in our projects, they perhaps feature in some of the videos, um, with, whether it's Shuostak or Fina Nekidin, and they also use this content um, as sort of as a starting point or not just promoting it online, but also using the language of it, using it for, um, for discussions. Um, so some of the networks that we have, one is um, a forum of religious leaders in Lebanon, and they're very involved with Tayyidiyah, either in producing content, but also in using this content within the networks that they have. And this is a core part of our PVE strategy, which is that there are spheres of influence and those who are most vulnerable to be recruited um, to extremist ideology, Adian can't reach them. You know, we don't have the language or the commonality to reach them, but the people that we work with, those religious leaders, they are in the right communities and they have the language and the commonality to reach those people who are vulnerable. So with our media content, um, they engage with it, they help us with the content, and they also use that as part of their outreach. That's one network that we have. And then we also have a regional um, network of religious scholars. And again, they use the content that we have, they help produce it, and they also use the content that we have in their messaging and in their, um, in their narrative. So in their real world offline conversations with people, whether they are academics or whether again they are maybe religious figures so the kind of language and the messages 
um, that we use in our online work. This is also being the exact same work and language is being used in our offline work as well. So I think that's quite an important um, approach that we have is that we don't see the online space as distinct, completely distinct from the real world. We're very keen to, um, to create that, um, that awareness that these can also be, this needs to make a change in the real world as well. And I think, you know, one of the things that with the online space, you know, it's a problem with things like online bullying or, or negative speeches that people think I can just say whatever I want without thinking about this is a real person that you are speaking to. I think this kind of disconnect that we can have when we think the online space is just distinct and it's just words on a screen and not real people. This I think can be a problem with the online world. So we're very keen to make sure that we also think about using the same messages throughout our networks in the offline space as well. Very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bahar, um, how does uh, Tech for Peace use its uh, digital platforms? Sorry, go again. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Bahar, what I, what I was uh, over to you. Uh, how, how does uh, Tech for Peace use its digital platform in promoting social cohesion? Well, uh, all our based, uh, all our work actually based online, uh, and then and I mean like ninety percent of it, a part of the trainings that we do it physically. But uh, how we do do we use a digital to in order to promote the social cohesion? As I mentioned briefly, uh, on in the first question, that is by showing people. Uh, not everything that you are reading that it's written against one on to other. When we are talking about Iraq, uh, we are mentioning here there is seven to eight different religions that they are in Iraq living all together. And then uh, every single religion they have like Kurds and Turkmen. So they are very uh, the pluralism and then uh, 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 multi uh, ethnic groups that they are living in Iraq. So. This uh, mess that happens actually, it's uh, uh, we try to to counter it and combat it by saying by 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 using our uh, social media platforms. Uh, it's not true enough that what you hear, you have to always get through the sources uh, to see whether that it came from them or not. Uh, the, the the example that I gave. Uh, what could get uh, against the social cohesion? It's uh, uh, it's by spreading the rumors about uh, the the Kirkuk. What, what happened in 2018 uh, when the Baghdad central government has tried to take uh, control over what's happening in Kirkuk and so on? Because there is like this infinity uh, problems between. Uh, Baghdad and Erbil uh, governments about Kirkuk and stuff. So they, the all that the rumors they were spreading that uh, uh, the, the the Iraqi army has been coming into Kirkuk in order to uh, to arrest and then uh, uh, to mass use their power in order to take out all of the Kurds again from. Uh, to, to take them out of from Kirkuk. So uh, easily, uh, hundreds of people, they were like leaving their homes, leaving their, where, where they were living in order to, to, to go to Kurdistan region, like more deep in the north. But then like, this is how, what, the, the role that we play in order to, uh, to showing the truth, in order to giving them a tools that they can verify by themselves in order that uh, that's not true. Uh, 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 the digital security has an, uh, as we call it in Arabic, it's a weapon that has two sides, whether you use it for good or whether you use it in order to create a mass. So we promote it by by the defeating the the the, uh, the the fake news and rumors that comes from the source itself, no matter what what's the background of the the, the ones that they spread it. Thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just Faisal, just briefly, do you want to just mention Fatal uh, Hikma 2.0 and? Bell Arabi, uh, you know, the IBB platforms and how they're utilized? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we, I mean, we definitely take the, the kind of the cultural context and really um, the 
cultural identity of most of our audience or really the target audience um, in when we designed our programs and kind of even our branding our programs. So our main program, which is the kind of the, 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 the one that I was talking about in terms of translation and content, and we have a university program inside Iraq and Mosul and other parts of the country, it's called Beit al Hikmah 2.0. And Beit Hikma is used to used to be in the 13th century a symbol for translation and knowledge and knowledge exchange and pluralism in the Middle East. So when we try when we are trying this create new content and to make it culturally relevant, that it is not new that people from the Middle East used to learn from others or be exposed to different ideas from different cultures, but rather as something um, that it always existed. In history, and that's why the, the name of the program is Beit Al Hikma 2.0. So, kind of the renovation, the recreation of that um, symbol. And, and uh, the other program, which is which is a program that we uh, partner with FNF, which is Frederick Schnoman Foundation in the Middle East and North Africa, and it's about highlighting, uh, as was Christina was saying, is that highlighting positive role models um, and people who do good in society. Um, who are from the region who many people can look up to. I mean, growing up, we look up that all what we were taught is Saddam Hussein, and this is the guy that you should look up to. And um, as in the case, and unfortunately, post, uh, post that. So the thing is that how can we create positive um, and, and really highlight uh, positive role models? Because there are many of them, and they, they are not given as much a platform as the, the other side. And one thing I, I, I would like to just mention, which I think it's probably agreed upon by, by everybody here, is we are also at a major disadvantage. Uh, there, are, there are two things that I would like to highlight that I think are relevant in this conversation is that the bad actors and, and state actors have billions of dollars of funding and infrastructure that have existed for decades to spread that misinformation. Um, so that's that's one thing. So like many of the whether it's the channels that spread this information or uh, or the other. So in a way is that they have what I call a fertile crescent of misinformation. There's already a fertile ground that existed in the region that they keep pounding on, and um, th so there is a lot of work ahead of us. And and second thing and and back to kind of studies and, and research is that most I mean the latest one. Uh, about Twitter platform of how um, misinformation spreads faster than factual information. So in a way is that we also have to create content that is super, super engaging, that is far more engaging than the, the, the more comfortable emotional lingo uh, that most, most misinformation actors uh, play on uh, that uh, we, we definitely have to so in a way, it's like everybody here on the panel is a, is a super <laughs> is a superhuman uh, in, in a way in terms in terms of how to challenge uh, actors and really an environment an ecosystem of information that has for decades uh, been corrupted by conspiracy theories and uh, and 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 disinformation. So Faisal, you really just uh, that was just great because you queued up my next question for uh, for the panelists, which were, you know, in the, given the context out there, the these uh, big actors um, uh, and the fact that uh, you know, uh, what is the saying that the the truth is uh, that uh, uh, um, you know a uh, uh, an untruth or a lie is half is all the way around the world by the time the truth puts its boots on. Um, I'm messing up a, a, an American uh, quote of uh, 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 Mark Twain, I think, there. But in any event, um, I, I'm curious, uh, what are some of the challenges that um, you guys are facing uh, organizationally or programmatically in combating disinformation? Um, Christina, do you want to um, uh, take that on? Yes, of course. Okay, uh, so concerning the challenges, we actually face um, one of the challenges that we face when we're creating the content, for example, is first that people that we are targeting do not know how much their initiatives are powerful. They do not, they do not believe how much they can make change in their communities because as we talked before, 
the violence is something that they feel proud of and they want to show. But when we're working about peace, uh, people feel more humble and they do not know how much their uh, initiatives are uh, change making and they are powerful. So when we look, for example, for stories, uh, for what's your story campaign, we find it really difficult to find these stories, not because they are not there, but because the people do not show up and they do not have the courage all the time to show it up. And hopefully during this session, we'll talk about uh, some uh, examples about success stories on how some heroes did show up through these campaigns. At the same time, um, we have to admit that the extremist narrative is actually uh, very strong and it's widely spread. So being able to counter that requires from us uh, being well structured and well structured and well organized and our narrative to be as powerful as the extremist narrative. And this requires, I believe in my opinion, to have a network, not only one platform, but a network of platforms, a network of organizations that to collaborate together, which is somehow we still lack in the Middle East and the Arab world in specific. So, uh, we see a lot of organizations working separately, but I believe we need like an alliance, just like the alliance for uh, peace building, to be able to counter that because uh, individual efforts or organizational efforts will not be able to counter um, this uh, global uh, phenomenon, if I may say, but we need uh, to combine these efforts together. In addition, for example, for us at Adyan, when we talk about media, we also talk about profits, but such topics that we are tackling are not money maker. So to ensure the sustainability of a media project, it's sometimes a challenging. So either we get funds or we have to find new business models and develop new business models to be able to uh, generate uh, profit for the media organization uh, just to sustain uh, this message and to keep it uh, as strong as uh, the narrative that it's countering. So I think uh, it's a challenge that we don't have a clear answer for yet. It's uh, the business model. And I hope we will be able to, uh, we are in the process of thinking at ASEAN Foundation on how we can develop a business model that will allow us to sustain in the platform. Great, great. Uh, that, thank you for that, Christina. Carolyn, uh, I, I know I keep asking this, but do, do you want to add to that? Or uh, I, uh... Yeah, no, it's, it's great for me because Christina gives me lots of things for me to talk about <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of um, continue on what Christina was saying that, you know, something that we think about is that the negative news, the extremists, you know, these really can grab the headlines, they can... Um, you know, they can dominate um, and, you know, this, this sells, you know, particularly these days, this sort of very shocking extreme news can dominate. But, you know, we are also very interested and, you know, it's something that we don't have the final answer about how we're going to work on this. You know, like Christina is saying, networks are important, but, you know, there is also this silent majority, like Christina is saying, the individuals who are doing amazing work in their communities without even realizing just how powerful that is. And we haven't really got time today to talk about some of the specific examples, but you know, we have really interesting examples of shoe Ostex that we've done of individuals who were doing incredible work that was bringing peace to their communities and to um, really shape a younger generation. And when we when we created their story as shoe Ostex, you know, they went on to win an award in Egypt. They didn't know that what they were doing was really anything out of the ordinary, but it really empowered them to, and it empowered others to think about individual steps that they can do. So, you know, I think we do have to be aware of this silent majority that we have. And I think, you know, we're talking a lot about, of course, the online space now and fake news, but let's not forget that, you know, fake news isn't a new concept. I mean, before we had the internet, if you think, you know, I'm from Europe, if you think about how 100 years ago, the kind of news that we got, you know, this was very much state controlled. You only get one narrative. You just really get what the government wants you to hear. So, you know, fake news isn't a new concept, but um, you know, now with the online space, it's become a, a very different, very different um, world. Um, but of course, there is, there are other narratives too. And we have to make sure that they don't get drowned out with this proliferation of, or liberalization of media content. We have to make sure that that the, um, the silent majority and the positive stories also um, shine a light as well. 
Yes, uh, that is a succinct outlining of the challenge, Carolyn. Thank you. Um, Bahar, um, how do things look in terms of challenges from a, a, an Iraqi perspective for Tech for Peace? Well, uh, if I want to talk about challenge, there is a lot, but I will just keep on the, the, the most important thing. And there is, uh, we are facing two methods of challenge, like uh, uh, online and on the ground. Uh, what we are facing now in Iraq, uh, we have more than 200 volunteers in Tech for Peace, and then none of them are knowing that, and they can show up that they are volunteers with Tech for Peace, a part of me being a spokesman of the initiative and living out of Iraq and that doesn't have any, uh, doesn't have any intention in order to go back to Iraq. So this is what the work that what, what we do since 40 years until now, uh, everybody in the team, they, 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 they uh, uh, deserve to be proud of what they are giving and delivering, but the fact that nobody of them can actually announce that they are part of us. Uh, and that's why, because of the, the security issues that they might get. Uh, when we counter uh, 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 the, the, the misinformation, disinformation, there is uh, parties, armed group, uh, 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 militias who they are who they who they get the benefits actually from creating the mass so we when we come back actually the, the the facts and then what's happening inside and then uh, and then just digging deep in order to get the source and shining and sparkling and give it to the people themselves they get actually uh, very angry about us or they try to find us where uh, we are where from because that doesn't help their uh, intentions why when they are separating the propaganda. So this is one of the uh, biggest challenges that we are facing. Uh, me being uh, living in, in, in Europe at the moment and then far away, like uh, I, uh, uh, in order to, if I wanna go back to Iraq uh, in these days, since we started the initiative and we got like a very powerful truth uh, uh, source that, I have to measure the risk and uh, the, the, the positive that uh, uh, what comes there if I visit Iraq. So imagine that facing, uh, uh, combating and countering uh, the, the, the what's going on is a fake that becomes a high risky on your personal uh, security that you can visit a country or announce by yourself. So this is uh, the, the one of the biggest challenges that we are facing. And also uh, uh, that's a physical term. And then and if I'm talking about the online, what we are facing, uh, there is a lot of kind of uh, people that we are interacting with them, uh, who they have like beliefs, like let's say a religious belief uh, uh, or their sexual belief that no matter what you give them as a as a sources in order in order to show them this is a fake, they wouldn't they wouldn't accept it. They wouldn't uh, take it in count. They would always get where their their religious or uh, sectarian belief are in order to to uh, uh, that that they will always try to put you in 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 uh, in, in, in a side where, for example, if there is a uh, a fake news that comes from a site that, and, and I, I, I debunked it, they will think that uh, they will think that I have been sponsored by, for example, Saudi or Iran or Turkey. This is the this is the challenge that we face. Uh, even though that we do cover all of the, uh, the, 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 the fake information that going on online, but always they will try to put you that you have an, some sort of an agenda and you have some sort of uh, 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 funds uh, and agenda that you are trying to play in the, in, the, in the contest itself. So these are the two facing method uh, challenges that we are facing. Right. So, Bahar, you remind me of something, uh, Faisal. You know, one of the things you've said is that uh, you know you can't go out and combat every piece of disinformation or misinformation uh, that's out there. Uh, there has to be an approach of providing other kinds of content. Um, you know, can you talk about that uh, as a as a challenge and how uh, 
IVV deploys beta al -Hikma. Just sort of briefly, I, I'm a little cognizant of time here. We're gonna go, next question, uh, just alert to panelists, we're gonna go to lightning rounds uh, so that we can get some time in for discussion. But Faisal, back to this question of how um, you deploy um, beta um, you know, in the face of these uh, challenges. Yeah, so one of the one of the things that uh, we're very cognizant about with with being um, small nonprofit is also how to think of long term solutions, and we one of the also things that there is also notice and and Bahar can also touched on it already is how the fact that there is a misinformation maybe every five seconds in the region, and the ability to counter each one of them um, is almost impossible. Is humanly impossible. So the the goal is how to create um, back to like create. I mean, there is one thing to create a literate population, but there's another thing to be a, a digitally literate population or a media literate population. And how to um, really? I mean, one of the videos that, that I think was really interesting that we created about how to avoid sensational headlines and how to uh, when you are browsing the the, the internet and browsing YouTube really because it, it has a lot of these. Uh, um, I mean, even in English, it's 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 uh, same because everybody's trying to get uh, the the user attention of how to avoid these these uh, when you, when you look at these terms and really how to avoid opinion section versus editorial. You would be surprised that many people do not differentiate between somebody writing an opinion about something and actually a report about something. And 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 I mean, in America, there is obviously the business of a news show host and 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 many multiple people who are constantly uh, filtering filtering things from from that angle. But I think is that really uh, one of the videos that really like was got a lot, did a lot of conversation, but also informed a lot of people about how to really differentiate between um, that between the opinion versus editorial, how to avoid sensational headlines, and really how can you create a population that is. Um, I call it the vaccine against misinformation. You, I mean, in the ways that you create a vaccinated population uh, that will not be receptive to uh, extremist propaganda, that will not be receptive to uh, misinformation from states or non-state actors. And that is really the, the, the ultimate goal uh, of all of us here. Okay. All right then, and now time for a lightning round. Uh, I know that in many ways, many of you have been already talking about uh, successes in the context of this conversation, but um, uh, Carolyn, uh, Christina, would you wanna highlight a, uh, what, look, what success looks like from Adyen's perspective within a, a concrete example? Um, uh, can you do that? Yeah, maybe I'll just say something about, um... One of the successes that we have, and this addresses a lot about what Faisal has been talking about, you know, about a vaccine for misinformation and this idea of critical thinking that Faisal was also talking about. And some of the questions that we've also been receiving about how to build empathy and how to, you know, create social cohesion and peace. And, you know, for us, the success that we have had, one of our core successes is our long running Alwan program, which we have been running since 2007 and we run it in schools and this really teaches young people critical thinking and to know and to understand the other and we really find that working with these young people you know um the feedback that we've got you know we've had educators and we've got alumni who have been with this program since 2007 and we receive a lot of anecdotal information about the impact that this has had on their lives and we also heard about this during the, um, the Saura, the revolution uh, that began in October last year in Lebanon. And, you know, people anecdotally said to us that the way, particularly at the beginning, the way that young people, um, you know, cross communities, cross sectarian, the way that young people at the start really had this sense of solidarity and it being one nation. And anecdotally, we had people who've been involved in Alwan and they said the young people who are, I mean, a lot of young people were really at the driving, you know, the driving seat of this revolution um, and they said that the way young people are operating they wouldn't be operating like that they wouldn't be treating each other and thinking in such a way was it not for their participation in Alwan um, I mean this is anecdotal and um, but we've we've received a lot of information about 
the critical thinking, the respect for other, the knowledge about, um, uh, you know, about um, social cohesion and respect for other religions and other cultures. Um, and we found that because of the impact on these young people, we realized that actually we need to address even younger people. So Alwan is for grades 10 and 11, and we've now started Alwan Junior for younger children. This is a more recent project because we realized that it makes such a difference to young people, um, but we have to actually even reach them earlier. And I would say this is addresses a lot of the questions we've been talking about, you know, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a vaccine, but maybe it's part of the vaccine is teaching young people critical thinking skills so they can um, encounter fake news and encounter it, you know, so they won't believe so much the fake news, so they won't spread the fake news, but also, and we've done studies recently about inherited prejudices. Um, we, talk, we, do, we have a project about sectarianism in Lebanon and a lot of young people talked about inherited prejudices. So. Um, so again, we need to think about critical thinking to break these cycles. Um, so anyway, yeah. that's a very long answer, sorry for the quick fire round, but I would say our critical thinking work <laughs> with generations of young people in Lebanon, I'd say is a big success. That's a whole lot of lightning. Uh, lightning <laughs> storm, lightning sorry. Mm -hmm. so, so, but that's okay. So uh, what, what was also good there was that you mentioned a little bit about some of the challenges around measuring success, uh, which I hopefully we can get into that during the discussion. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, with, with respect, Christina, I'm gonna move to Bihar just to see if uh, uh, we can get a tech for peace uh, example of what success looks like, just a, a succinct one, Bihar, if you will. Yes, uh, for since uh, most of our work are uh, online and what we do, so we get like all of this uh, feedbacks uh, from the people that themselves, whatever now goes like online, viral on social media uh, in the Iraqi community, the first question will come to the people's mind themselves without, uh, out of the, our volunteers. It's uh, did Tech for Peace deny to prove it? So that is a success itself that we could gain that much people's uh, in order to trust and be their source. Uh, uh, will will they will uh, stop uh, reacting and then following and and then uh, getting separated more if Tech for Peace hasn't denied it or uh, or proved it yet. Uh, and then one very small, uh, uh, sh like very short, uh, as a success example that I counted personally, and I talked about always about it. It's in a couple of years ago when Mosul has been liberated fr uh, from ISIS, and then uh, there was this kind of uh, 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 publishing uh, the, 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 the fake information about uh, people themselves where uh, where they don't like each other or they have problems against each other. So they published all of the information about a guy with his picture and then with the name of an ISIS member that has been killed previously. And then the, the Iraqi go country, uh, the government, they has been arrested that guy uh, because like uh, they got the names and stuff like from the internet, what was going viral and his family, they escaped to Northern Iraq. We could get a very detailed research about it. And then by, by publishing that on our platforms, his brother at, uh, actually got our post and then like, uh, and printed all, all the sources and, and delivered to the government and they released him and his family, they could get back to his home as well so that's one of the very big uh, uh, the that, things that we do and then I am proud to always to 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 talk about it as a very sexy story that is amazing um, okay those are uh, those are some real successes um, I think what we want to do now before we move into uh, question and answer I, I'm going to insist on that lightning round again uh, what recommendation would um, uh, the experts on this panel uh, make for local NGOs or partners on the ground attempting to deal with this disinformation landscape? Um, Faisal, what I want to do is just kick off with you, and then we'll go to Carolyn and Christina, and then and then Bahar. Um, so, Faisal, what what recommendation would you make uh, to others that are engaged in this effort? Because I'm assuming that just about everyone. Uh, who's present on this Zoom call is, is, is facing these challenges. One word, consistency. Um, I mean, I, I've, I mean, my background is, is in digital marketing. And one of the things is that one of the actually successes of misinformation actors 
is that you receive the same message every week. So like, I mean, as uh, growing up, I mean, we had the Thursday, during Saddam Hussein, we had the Thursday morning, right? So you say a quote from Muhammad, the a quote from the Quran, a quote from Saddam Hussein, and then you maybe burn the American flag. And if you do that every week for three years, it sticks with you, uh, if not more. So the thing is that if all of the uh, local NGOs, all of actually even national, international NGOs, is that this is a this is an endless endeavor. There has to be consistent messaging, consistent content. I mean, in, by digital marketing, they say you have to touch the person seven times for the message to even resonate. So, so the same person have to watch the content seven times for them to maybe consider you as a valid part of the spectrum of information that they receive. Um, so if you are a local NGO, you have a power of like really within your local community is see if you can figure out a weekly hangout uh, about the, the conversation of, of fighting uh, misinformation because otherwise out of sight, out of mind, and you'll be forgotten in a little bit because there's all, you go to the Facebook again and you, you are bombarded with a lot of information from different sources and you forget that you have even encountered the one before. So consistency is the thing that I would advocate for and it's advice I need to follow as well. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Faisal, thank you. Consistency. Uh, uh, Carolyn and Christina, um, do you have a word or two? Christina, you should go first this time after I spoke so much last time. Yeah, I'll, I'll just go very briefly, then give you the floor. So um, I, if we go back to the initial um, pillar of this conversation, we're talking about social cohesion. And I believe when we talk about social cohesion, we're talking about this space where there is a, a common set of values that people share in a society and a community or even in the world. So I believe whatever the tool that you are using, education, media, uh, policy making, uh, research, everything, we have to focus on uh, enhancing the values and uh, enlarging the space where people can learn the new values and can share the values and have this common space together. Because if people will not have common values that share uh, all over the world, we will not be able to um, to succeed in creating social cohesion and even preventing violent extremism or countering hate speech or all the missions. I think everything starts from the values and here the education plays a very essential role. Thank you. And Carolyn, do you have a recommendation to add to that? Yeah, I touched on it before, but I would say think about who you can reach, you know, you as the peace building community as an organization, there's a circle of people that you can reach and you can influence, but that might not be the people that you need to make the change with ultimately. So I would say think about who you can influence and who they can influence and who and who they can influence even further if, if needs be. So think about the different levels that you need to influence because you probably can't reach. And this is what this is what we find with our PVE theory, you know, we can't reach those people most at risk of um, being recruited by extremist ideology, but we can definitely reach those who can then influence them. So I think have a strategy where you are aware of what your level of influence is, but then build on that. Think about how to empower those people that you work with to increase their platform. And that's a big part of our work as well. We're very keen to empower and um, and you know really um, strengthen the platform. All these people who have a different level of outreach than we can ever have. Invaluable uh, strategic perspective. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bahar. What uh, uh, from a tech for peace perspective? Uh, what recommendation would you make, having been on the ground in the field online for these last uh, uh, many years? Bahar. Ah, well, perhaps he's uh, muted or uh, had to drop off for some reason. So uh, we're going to move on to our uh, Q&A period here. We have uh, uh, roughly a little less than 15 minutes for, for that, uh, for the discussion. And what I'm going to do is pick items up from the chat. And what I've just noticed is this, this, this enormous chat. <laughs> and I'm going to apologize in advance for missing all this, these, these absolutely incredible questions. Uh, so I'm going to do my best. I want to start off with uh, Britt Sloan's question. He says, I'm interested to hear uh, the thoughts of the panelists on how we can in uh, create incentives for people to engage in meaningful rumor control. In other words, 
your the followers or constituents, how do you actually incentivize them uh, to engage in rumor control? Especially because it's so easy for people to simply believe in conspiracy theories out there and you know allow them to feed their fears. So um, how do you incentivize people? Uh, anyone? Um, and I can start. Uh, please do. Um, yeah, I mean that, that's something that we always think about of, of really the question of sustainability and also um, the question is how to create uh, truth defenders. And really, um, I mean, that's one of the things that, that we are aiming to do with Wikipedia and really volunteer culture within the MENA region to make sure that uh, Wikipedia is constantly uh, updated and matches um, the other one around the world. And I mean, there are two, two I mean, capitals. There's the financial capital and the, and the social capital. And it, it might sound like a, na like a na naive, but even very simple thing to, to say, is to really make it cool. Um, is to make it interesting to be yeah. on the side of the fact checkers. And because, the, I mean, I, I grew up in, when, when extremist recruiting was common in my neighborhood and also common in the area of West Baghdad that I grew up in. And there was something really interesting about joining a terrorist group. Um, it, 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 there was, you are, you are a, you're a strong man, you are, you are, you're defending your neighborhood, you are the, um, you have all of the kind of detachments, you're called Mujahid, you're called a lot of things that are mainly positive. And you don't have to kill anybody, you just have to join. But so the thing is, is if we, obviously we don't have that <laughs> going on our end, but, but I think is that if we make it as socially important, as socially powerful uh, to be held, uh, I mean, we, we have a lot of respect for imams and, and church leaders and all of that stuff. Well, probably we should do, do similar for fact checkers and to be, for them to be held into some respect to the way that will be a social capital and incentive for people that when they are on the side of facts, they are uh, viewed uh, with respect. Very good. Now, Bahar, I don't know if you've rejoined us at all or no. Okay. All right. Well, we have another question here. Uh, it comes from uh, Kate uh, Ketor, I think, uh, and it's for Faisal. And it's um, she asks, do you think it requires uh, working with the social media platforms to help create bubbles of peace uh, as opposed to bubbles of uh, in misinformation? And I want to jump off on her question, Faisal, because it reminds me of the dialogue that we've had with some of the uh, 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 folks at Facebook who are concerned with sort of combating, uh, you know, uh, counter extremism. Uh, and I remember your question was, well, what about the good guys? Can you just talk a little bit about how uh, you look at these two things, the positive versus uh, the negative? Yes. Yeah, so, um... One of the things that that I, th I think it, I mean, it's I mean, a question and messaging question also, is that there's a lot of focusing on countering violent extremism, right? Countering the bad narrative, but the question is that how can you promote the good narrative, and not take kind of the precautionary approach or the prevention approach, but rather focus on really making the the good things happening to be and amplify that, not necessarily to counter violent extremism per se, but really to amplify it for amplifying its sake. And then as a consequence will be the counter violent extremism. So that's that's something that uh, we have, take, I mean, one of the reasons why we, the program we launched with Arabi was to highlight the kind of the voices in the region um, that are positive. And also to, to add to what Christina was saying about really the need for, an, I mean, if the bad guys are united, why not the good guys uh, or the good people? And really kind of, I mean, just from this panel, I, I learned a lot from I mean, I know Adyan and us both applied for the same grant uh, just the last month. So we definitely are in the same space. And, and it would be great for really us from sharing our experiences and expertise to really uh, work together um, to learn from each other as we're doing right now. Great. Uh, um, another question is, um, there's this question about uh, that uh, uh, actually, so I'm not sure who raised this question about trust and what is the role of trust in um, your program's uh, success or failure? Because if 
you're not a trusted source, then obviously you're not going to influence anyone. But how do you develop that trust uh, in the community and how do you engage people in that way over time? What's the best strategy for that? Uh, Christina or Carolyn, do you want to take that up? Yeah, I can take a bit about the media aspect. Maybe Caroline can talk more about the offline work that we're doing. But I believe um, the first step to build the trust with the people is to speak their language, as simple as that. First, to speak their language and engage with them. So this is what we do on Tahadudiya page. We try to simplify our content as much as we can. As, we, as I mentioned at the beginning, we use this existential narrative to use uh, credible um, images or um, profiles of heroes, but at the same time, in the articles, in all the videos that we share, we try to use the language of the people. And when we have this, we receive a lot of comments, we receive a lot of feedback, we try as much as possible uh, to engage with the audience, to when they ask questions, when they uh, raise a negative comment, we try to ask questions and open conversation about it. Uh, very rarely we do uh, remove any comment, um, except if there is something um, that's against our media policy, but uh, we try as much as we can to moderate the conversation, get in touch with people and speak their language. Ah, very good. Uh, Carolyn, did you have a, a, anything that you wanted to add to that? Or? Yeah, just quickly, I think that um, the networks also of an organization are such a huge factor in terms of it building trust, you know, because these these people, um, they're not employed necessarily by the organization, but they really are the ambassadors of an organization. And this can really improve the and enhance the outreach um, of an organization and also also that trust because you know we're 19 people at Adyen, but we have a huge network. Um, we have um, ambassadors, we have youth network, um, both in Lebanon and in Iraq. We also have um, a network of trainers, um, and this you know in 13 different countries across MENA. And this really helps, I think, with with trust because these are the people who are working at the grassroots, you know, every day. So I think the fact that we have these long-standing and these are ongoing, you know, these these networks and also our alumni groups. I mean, these are with us for life. Um, I think this really helps that we have these existing and continual networks in many different communities across the region. I think this is a big part of our um, of trust building. So Faisal, did you wanna just mention just briefly a, a little bit about trust building in the IBB context? And then uh, there are a couple of other really good questions I wanna to get to here. So, so go right ahead. Uh, Faisal, you're Sorry, on. I, I, I've, finally, I've made the mistake of muting myself. Um, so really, the, I mean, one of the things that we um, have focused on is making sure that our staff, which is mostly based in the MENA region, um, is to be kind of the face of the organization. Because at the beginning, when they see so, so this organization is Ideas Beyond Borders and based in New York City, um, definitely not the, the, the best um, and kind of first thing impression that people that people in, the, in who are in the audience we want them to get so um speaking the language obviously all of our content is in arabic and in kurdish uh, to some extent uh focus a lot on the youth to, in that way many of the example that we highlight tend to be uh relevant to the the audience uh which is that that follows us and also uh making sure that that the faces that we represent or the people that we made kind of the face of the organization are from the region, speaking to people in the region. Very good. So there's a question here from Thor, which is, uh, can any, any one of you can take this. Uh, uh, he's at uh, a peace, uh, peace to Everyone, and uh, he works in Mexico and says that, I've worked with participatory video to counter government lies and misinformation spread through media and local uh, context. And he says, I'd love to know about experiences using uh, participatory video, if any of have done that in, in MENA, uh, or if any of uh, you have worked with that. You want me to hold it? Hold what? The shower. No, what are you doing? Okay. Sorry. Uh, anybody work with that? Uh, Caroline or Christina? Sorry, your hair. Honestly, uh, we do not. Yeah, I can 
just comment on that. We do not have uh, participatory videos, but we do um, count on um, crowdsourcing and get information from the people. Sometimes, for example, when there is an event like Ramadan, um, the Ramadan uh, month, we try uh, to ask people to send us photos from uh, from their uh, celebrations, their events, and different to show this cultural aspect. But uh, we do not have yet a specific um, uh, like process of creating participatory videos to be able to uh, create a high quality uh, content for the page. But it's definitely the future and it's definitely um, a big need for each media platform to be able to engage its audience, not only in receiving its content, but also in creating it. Okay. All right, then we are uh, uh, just a couple minutes out here. If there's anyone, ah, so I see that Bahar has rejoined us. <laughs> Bahar, I just want to give you the last, the last word here before we close out this morning. If there's anything that, uh, I know you had a little bit of a technical difficulty. Is there anything that you'd like to comment on that you've heard during the discussion, during the, this Q and A discussion over the last couple of uh, minutes that you want to comment on? Yes, uh, the, the question about the trust, I think I uh, read it also yes. on the, on the uh, uh, chats that uh, she asked, like, how do you build a, uh, it's about giving the truth, it's about uh, a trust, right? So how do you build that trust uh, with your audience? Uh, uh, what I always mention uh, when I go online on TV or speaking out of our platforms, that we have been working here in order that myself, that uh, when we debunk all of this uh, uh, misinformation that's happening, I'm helping uh, from a perspective that from my from my mom, she always sends uh, messages to the page itself by asking about uh, misinformation. So that's a help starting from my family themselves and then expanding to the community all by itself. And then uh, we never, for example, we never give out an information without giving them a resource, uh, the source for it. So the people themselves, they can depend on just like about what we said about our analyzing. No, it's about this, uh, the source. So that uh, there isn't a discussion that how, why did you analyze it in that way? Why didn't you analyze it that way? No, this is the, that we, we wrote and minimize it, like sum it up for the people to, to clarify it and then they can uh, go back to see the, the source by themselves. So this is why how we built the trust in the last four years by giving out the, the source like a sparkling, a shining a, a, a thing to them so they can verify it by themselves. This is how I built the trust in my own initiative. Brilliant, trust but verify, <laughs> as uh, uh, someone once said. So I, I want to uh, uh, just uh, close this morning with, uh, uh, first of all, I'm deeply grateful. I think all of the panelists and uh, Faisal as a co-moderator, really deeply grateful for this opportunity for uh, the organizers of PeaceCon 2020. Uh, also to every participant here this morning, um, there, were, uh, there was such a, a rich and vibrant chat. I could, uh, there was just no way for, uh, to do justice to it, but those of you who are reading know you can give justice to it. Um, I hope that uh, you have the, a wonderful rest of your day and want to thank everybody very much for their participation, especially the panelists. Uh, and with that, I think we are closed for uh, this morning, this afternoon, and this evening. <laughs>